we are live good afternoon and welcome to the fourth special public lecture of vigyan vidushi 2021 physics today's lecture will be given by professor urbasi sina from rri and the lecture will be uh, coordinated by dr disha bhatia dr disha bhatia is a tfr alumna she did her phd at tfr in uh, theory physics and currently she is a visiting fellow at uh, institute of mathematical sciences chennai and now invite dr disha to introduce today's speaker uh, okay uh, so hello everyone uh, as ma'am mentioned that today uh, is the last the fourth and the last special lecture of this year's vigyan vidushi edition and we are very happy to have professor urbashi sinha with us who will be talking to us about the photonic quantum science and technology so professor sinha is currently working at the raman research institute bangalore where she is heading the quantum information and the computing lab she is also the associate faculty at the university of waterloo and university of toronto she completed her phd from cambridge university united kingdom where she carried out experiments related to high temperature superconductivity she also carried out the famous triple set experiment to verify the bond's rule during her postdoc days at university of waterloo so uh, her current lab at rri specializes in experiments on photonic quantum information processing including quantum computation and communication using single or entangled photons she is also currently heading india's first project on satellite based secure quantum communications her scientific recognitions include many to name a few she was awarded with the homi baba fellowship in the year 2017 in 2018 she received the icttt icu galileo dinardo award in optics she was also recognized as asia's top 100 scientist by the asian scientist in the year 2019 and she has also been awarded with the simmons emmy noider fellowship at the perimeter institute canada so she has also participated in various competitions for example in 2020 she led a two member winning team as a mentor at the world skills international competition in quantum technology organized by the quantum center in the moscow russia She also won the Association Women in Cyber Making a Difference Award in 2021. So, without uh, any further delay, we would like to now welcome Professor Sinha to kindly take over and begin with her exciting talk. So, over to you, Professor Sinha. Uh, you can start. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Disha, for this very kind introduction. Of course, uh, uh, you can hear me, right? That's usually the first thing one says nowadays. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, thank you. So, first of all, I mean, you know, I would like to uh, really thank uh, the Vigyan Vidushi program for uh, inviting me to present this seminar to you uh, here today, Vandana and the rest of the people who um, you know invited me here. Uh, it is indeed a huge honor, and of course, you know, it is somewhat uh, a double. a role that one is expected to play in this while you know giving a seminar on one's work is something that one is used to doing we are doing that a lot uh, but here i also um, you know uh, i'm expected to inspire some young women some young girls to carry on with a career in science and physics or, or science in general uh, through you know uh, some uh, being inspired by some of the work that we have done and this is of course a huge responsibility and i do hope that over the course of the next one hour to hearing about uh, the kind of work we do as well as a little bit about uh, my uh, journey as a scientist as a woman scientist i hope that you know at least a few people would uh, stay on in science uh, by uh, through that yeah so thanks a lot for this uh, wonderful uh, opportunity um as was uh, mentioned i'm going to of course talk on photonic quantum science and technology so with that i would like to share my screen and uh, hope for the best okay so and my screen is visible and uh, so on right yeah yeah 
Great. So, uh, well, so as was mentioned, the topic is going to be on photonic quantum science and technologies. And uh, that is what I'll spend a uh, better part of the time discussing. But then uh, given the special, uh, you know, circumstance and audience that we have, the primary audience that we have, I would like to spend a few minutes giving you a little bit of, a, a, you know, um, a snapshot of, uh, you know, my, my journey uh, to where we are uh, today. Um, well, when um, my, my career as a scientist, well, of course, you know, it began as a child with a lot of curiosity for science. And essentially, uh, from the very young age, it was quite clear that uh, it is maths and science, which I really like to uh, do and study and learn about more uh, in school and so on. Um, and uh, what is very important is the kind of support that I had from my family. My parents, uh, my uh, father, who was actually who's uh, no more, but then you know he was uh, he was a very he was a top ranking person in a nationalized bank, so he was not a scientist. But then you know he took a lot of joy in the fact that I had this scientific curiosity and did whatever was possible uh, to maintain that to nurture that. My mother, who chose to be a homemaker, uh, was uh, you know. Uh, exceptionally supportive and there was never any uh, what should I say any uh, um, expectation from any of them that I would have any gender stereotypical roles as I grew up so for instance I didn't do any cooking till I kind of landed up in Cambridge and uh, that was more by force because otherwise this potato pie with potato chips day in and day out may not be the best option for us. So then you learn a little bit and so that you can um, give vent to your Indian uh, palate. And so that is how it was. So there was never any expectation. So I've been really lucky in that. Uh, I did my undergrad at Jadavpur University in Kolkata in West Bengal. And in fact, I did my physics honors there. And that is where I met my, uh, you know, future uh, life partner, Onindo who is uh, um, also in academia. He's um, a faculty member at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. And uh, that I would say is another very uh, important aspect uh, in my journey because you know, we met really early and this has played a very important role in both our lives. You know? The fact that we are both scientists and thankfully doing very different things. He's a theoretical physicist, I am an experimental physicist. And so it keeps our conversations interesting. Uh, but then it also makes us understand each other's requirements as a scientist. So if I have to go at 2 a.m. to take some data, you know, in my PhD and postdoc days, I would do that. Now I'm forcing my students to do that. Whatever it is, uh, you know, it is something that he would appreciate as necessary. And similarly, I would appreciate the fact that he's trying to solve a mathematical problem while he's clearly talking to me or anyone in the family, but not really paying attention as something obvious and natural. So this is actually uh, has played a very positive role uh, in uh, the you know, uh, last couple of decades. I went on to do my uh, uh, master's, my natural sciences tripos in uh, University of Cambridge. And that is, uh, you know, essentially what gave the MSCI degree. I went with uh, what is called the Nehru Chevening Scholarship. Okay, And that is something important because uh, it was a full scholarship and uh, it was the only one given that year in physics. And I was very um, uh, lucky to get that because otherwise, you know, it's difficult to support, uh, uh, you know, such a thing abroad, you know, a lot of a lot more. Um, resources are required for self-funding, which of course we couldn't afford. So it was uh, really good that I got that. And similarly, I went on to do my PhD also in Cambridge uh, in a solid state quantum devices. Okay, And there I got the Gates Cambridge Scholarship, which was also a fully funded one. And again, a very prestigious one and very important and necessary. Um, uh, these things uh, made me realize that, you know, at the scholarship level, I did not really see uh, any particular bias, uh, which was gender based. So it was specifically based on merit and, you know, how you performed in the interviews and so on. Uh, so the, I did not really uh, feel any sort of bias was being done in these uh, choices that were being done uh, for, me, for my batchmates and so on uh, during this time. Okay, and uh, the solid state devices is something which uh, use Josephson junctions. And in fact, I'm told by Vandana that next week, my uh, friend and, and now colleague at TIFR, Vijay, is going to give you some technical lectures on quantum uh, technologies, which of course, I hope uh, you will follow really well. And then maybe some of what I say will make a little more sense in that 
uh, respect. And um, so that is what I did. And then I went on uh, to do a postdoc in soft condensed matter. So I've always had this thing of working on diverse areas, you know, not just sticking to one. So solid state quantum for my PhD, then soft condensed matter for the first postdoc in Cavendish Labs. And this was a, a, a collaboration with industry. Okay. And so this was a collaboration with the South African pulp and paper industry. And the project was on making white paper whiter, okay. uh, which sounds interesting. Uh, but then the idea is that as you make something white, you add more pigment to it, and then it becomes thicker. So the idea was to use sol gel techniques to have thin paper also equally white. And this was fascinating for me because, you know, it taught me how the kind of work we uh, do can be useful in um, practical scenario. And I actually went to Austria to uh, in Graz to their factory and did the knowledge transfer for the project that I worked on. So it gave me a flavor of industry academia interaction. And this is something really the younger people here the, who are uh, in the audience, they should take attention, take, take note of, you see, it's not necessary to have just this conventional route for staying on in science, which of course I ended up taking, but then, you know, you can always explore scientific domain through government agencies, through industry, and, and you know, many other options exist. And they are all very interesting and exciting. Um, my second postdoc was at the Institute for Quantum Computing, which is, of course, here because I'm still an affiliate faculty there. And that is where I worked extensively on photonic quantum science and technologies, which is what I continue to work on uh, now, at least for the last 10 years. We have been focusing on that in our lab uh, at RRI. And uh, so, uh, you know, I came back to India in 2012 and started this uh, lab, which was in fact one of the first labs in India uh, focusing on photonic uh, quantum science and technologies. So far, so good. So this is essentially a snapshot of how we are, uh, how I ended up being where I am. And, um, you know, having said that, it's, um, it's a mix. So the question is, uh, did I have uh, any particular, do I have anything particular to say about how my gender may have played a positive or negative role in this journey. And so, as I said, in the beginning, in the student years, I don't think there was any uh, necessary uh, distinction that I faced, except that in, I have worked in several labs and there have always been one or two, uh, you know, people who have had obvious bias and, you know, uh, negative connotations for the female gender. And that, that's not just me in particular or anyone in that lab. And so that uh, those people will exist and you just don't worry about them. Uh, but then when I, uh, you know, in the advanced years, when I was actually finishing my postdoc and coming back uh, and, you know, in the uh, not not yet coming back, I, I was uh, I went the family way. OK, and that was, uh, you know, very nice for us. Uh, but then uh, the director of IQC, who was my mentor, Raymond Laflamme, he was extremely encouraging, actually, to be uh, very uh, frank. He was very supportive and, you know, uh, said that, you know, this is this is great. And, you know, I would go on maternity leave and then um, basically come back and finish my postdoc, which is what I ended up doing. But then the person I was working with directly at that time, uh, of course, I won't take his name. I was not really very supportive. You know, he was kind of completely aghast, right? Somebody was going to have a baby. That that seemed um, really uh, very stressful to him. And so I have seen both types of reactions to such news. Uh, but then you just go ahead with the positives. And that is what I did and went back, finished my postdoc and came back and joined my uh, position at RRI. Okay, and this is what, uh, of course, I will be talking to you about for the next uh, half an hour, 45 minutes about uh, our work uh, on photonic quantum science and technologies and uh, what we do. Okay, and uh, so, okay. Right. So this is the Raman Research Institute, and this is essentially this building is where our lab is located. And on a better day, in a better year, we would have many visitors. So this is the inside, you know, of, of a snapshot of different experiments as they are happening in the lab. And of course, people should, uh, you know, if you're interested in this, please do have a look at our website, which has a lot more detail, which you can absorb uh, with a bit more time and so on. So we are a quantum optics lab, which is also class 10,000 clean room which means we have less than 10,000 dust particles per cubic foot, okay? Uh, that is what this means. And so here, smaller number means better. So usually in the environment we are in, we are in a 10 lakh environment. So we have 10 lakh dust particles per cubic foot. So our lab has uh, two orders of magnitude 
uh, cleaner environment, which is done with a purpose, right? And we also have plans of making a hundred class hundred, which will be even cleaner for devices. But at the moment, we are focusing on uh, optics-based uh, stuff, right? And so it's a very modulated environment with precise control on temperature and uh, and humidity, and is of course one of the leading labs in our country, which is dedicated to research in quantum information, computation, and communication. So uh, what is it? Um, so this is basically the website which you can have a look at. Uh, you know, again, coming back to the uh, gender dynamics in the lab, I mean, you know, I've actually highlighted in red the people who belong to the same gender as me and, and the rest uh, don't. And so, of course, you know, this is something one has to understand that, you know, as uh, Shubha Bhutidi mentioned in her talk a few days ago, there is what we call this leaky pipeline, right? So as we go up, uh, in our degrees or whatever, the number of people who belong to our gender kind of drops. And that is something which we discussed in her uh, talk last uh, week. Uh, and so this is something, you know, which uh, is what we want to address through these lectures that, you know, you stay on in your degrees in your BSCs and MSCs and carry on with research uh, so that we can help improve the statistics as we go up. But then having said that, you know, uh, what would be the experience that I, I say I've had with uh, different uh, genders in my students? Well, you know, uh, the people who are on this list, you know, as former or current members are clearly those uh, who uh, chose to work with us. And, and I have seen that, you know, the, the male uh, students, they tend to actually choose a certain subject area that is of interest to them, okay? And so this is what we, I want to work on for my PhD. And, and if uh, what we do appeals to them, they end up joining and so on. And so this is, uh, of course, how it should be. But then there, are, there have been two or three uh, over the last decade who actually joined with that motivation. But then and very soon they realized that, you know, they did not want to work with a, a guide who was female, you know, somehow a female supervisor they just couldn't, uh, you know, work with uh, that uh, dynamics. And so, in some, and, and of course, they uh, very quickly, they were not members of my lab because I, of course, uh, cannot, uh, this cannot happen, this cannot work. So they are not there. But then, you know, this uh, can happen. Uh, and something that a student should be consciously avoiding because, you know, the idea is to choose your science, uh, choose the science that you want to investigate you should bear in mind that uh, there is no correlation between um, a good scientist and any gender. And of course, that is what we are trying to establish through this program here, right? And of course, as you can see, there have been uh, female students in different ca categories who have been working with us, who have worked with us earlier. In the, in the female students, I've found, again, two types of um, you know, reactions. One, of course, you know, again, the same as the previous one where they want to work on in a certain domain and they choose their lab according to that, which is great. But sometimes I've seen a little bit of a hesitation, especially even in the female students, where they feel, oh, okay, maybe joining a male guide is perhaps better for my future career. And that is rubbish, right? Because of course, you know, your future career will be uh, decided by the kind of work you do at present, which will be the science again. It has, it will not really come with any uh, gender color. So then uh, that uh, is something, again, you should definitely not suffer from, especially the young female students who are a part of this Vigyan Vidushi program. Uh, you should definitely not have that at all in your mind because it doesn't make any sense, right? So this is our uh, lab, um, uh, you know, people. And, and okay, so now going on to the, uh, you know, the, the topics that we are working on in, in photonic uh, domain. Uh, one of the key areas that is of real interest to us is, you know, fundamental tests of various principles, uh, sp uh, specifically in the quantum domain. So tests of various principles, tests of various, uh, you know, theorems and, and so on in uh, both theory and experiment. And so this is very important because, you know, one good example is, as you can see, our theoretical understanding of the universe is very incomplete. So we don't understand more than 80% of what the universe is made of. So obviously, you know, a small, uh, you know, so understanding things precisely will have big ramifications overall in the big picture. And in fact, if I understand things at a foundational level, at a fundamental level better, I would be able to apply it better to the technology that I want to work on next. And so, you know, for instance, the two technologies which we are working on are quantum computing and quantum cryptography. Okay. 
whereas quantum computing is, uh, uh, of course, a very important research directions. And these are computers which use the laws of quantum mechanics to work. And uh, they are able to solve certain classes of problems for which uh, there is no efficient classical algorithm. Okay? And uh, there are also some solutions which will be exponentially faster than what is possible in classical computing. And this category actually has many more uh, takers than the first one. Okay. Uh, that you know, we know exactly which algorithms will work way faster than classical. And it's going to revolutionize uh, computing as well as, of course, several branches of science. Quantum cryptography, on the other hand, is something which is guaranteeing perfectly secure communication. Okay? And we will see soon how computing and cryptography are kind of the yin and the yang, or the head and the tail of a coin. And, and that is what is very interesting because we're working in both these areas. And I, I understand that next week you will have some technical lectures on the uh, basic principles of these topics. Yeah? So we work on experimental and theoretical domains related to fundamentals of quantum mechanics, quantum computing, as well as quantum communication. Okay. Okay, so a few minutes on what is quantum, yeah? Because of course I know that we have a very young audience. So, uh, and this is a very safe quote by Richard Feynman, who was a Nobel laureate. Uh, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics is what he said in 1965. But then, you know, uh, things have changed since then. We have 50 odd years, 56 years from the state. So we can add a little thing here and say nobody completely understands quantum mechanics because there are still many mysteries in quantum mechanics, which actually form the basis for all these applications that interest us. Okay, so that is what is very nice about quantum that you know there are new things to be done both at a fundamental level as well as at an application level even now, and and so all these things that you see on your screen here, I'm sure you recognize all of them. All of them have as their basis uh, principles of quantum mechanics, whether it's the MRI machine or whether it is your laser, right? Which of course we are working on, this is a laser pointer, yeah? So uh, everything is based on quantum. And, and in fact, quantum uh, mechanics and quantum theory has been so rich since its conception in terms of its contributions to fundamental science, that in fact, it has also been recognized through uh, many uh, Nobel prizes, you know, uh, over the last several years, whether it is, uh, you know, the Bohr model, the wave particle duality, you know, Thomson's uh, observation of properties of electrons as he passed them through a thin film. And of course, we have the double slit experiment, which is one of the, you know, one of my favorite experiments. And uh, in fact, uh, is uh, one of the most beautiful uh, demonstrations of what is called the wave particle duality. Um, and uh, so again, you know, Schrodinger, Dirac, Heisenberg, Max Born, all of them are Nobel laureates in physics with fundamental contributions to quantum. So what is quantum mechanics? Well, you know, in a very nutshell scenario, because we're giving, a, we're having a holistic discussion here. It's a theory which deals with phenomena at microscopic levels. Okay. But then the point is that uh, in some sense, quantum mechanics is able to describe uh, everything around us because everything around us will have a microscopic origin. So when does it kick in really? Uh, is classical enough? So that is the idea. So this boundary as to when classical stops being enough and when quantum is absolutely necessary uh, is uh, very interesting and in, in fact a topic of active research. And one way of looking at it would be that, you know, I talked about this, uh, the Broglie wavelength earlier, that lambda. So if that wavelength associated with the particle becomes comparable to let's say the size of the particle, that is when the quantum nature will kick in and you won't just get away with the, uh, you know, applying a classical approximation uh, to explain phenomena. So that would be one way of seeing where quantum comes in. Okay. And in fact, as I said, this double slit uh, is one of the most beautiful experiments in physics. And according to a poll conducted by New York Times, uh, it uh, was supposed to be uh, the most beautiful experiment, even according to this poll. Okay. Okay, now I want to go on and, and explain to you a couple of concepts uh, in a nutshell, uh, which are necessary uh, for various applications in quantum. And in fact, this is an interesting uh, uh, you know, statement here that the strangeness of the quantum world is perhaps what gives it the power. Okay, so first thing uh, is uh, what is called the quantum superposition principle. So what is the superposition principle? The superposition principle tells you that, you know, uh, a quantum state can exist in a basically a superposition of different possibilities. Okay. And that is very strange in our classical notion, but that is what our quantum computer is based on. 
In fact, all these things that you hear about, this various uh, advances that are happening in this domain, they're all based on the superposition principle. So what is a quantum bit? And so, you know, you have a in a classical system, you have these bits, the binary digits, that is the zero and the one. You can think of it as the off and the on uh, switch, uh, uh, you know, uh, off a switch, okay? off and the on state of a transistor. So basically an off switch and an on switch. You can think of it that way. But a quantum bit is something which can be a little bit off and a little bit on. Okay, So it is basically a, pos a, a, a plethora of possibilities of off and on in different proportions. And so it essentially is dis described by a sphere and the points on a sphere. So qubit might seem to contain an infinite amount of information because its coordinates can encode an infinite sequence of digits. Okay? But then ultimately, we are going to extract the information through measurement, which will boil it down to being either a zero or one. Okay, But in the process of evolution, it actually has access to this large space, which is this possibility of superposition. Okay, And so this uh, sort of explains uh, it in a diagrammatic sense. So this is a single qubit. Uh, then there are uh, two possibilities uh, in the classical bit. It's either zero or one. Quantum also, there are two. Right. But now if I go on to a three level, three, three bit system in the classical sense, then there will be one of eight possibilities, right? 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, so on. But in the quantum scenario, I would have all eight possibilities at the same time. So this is the superposition that I'm talking about. So now if I have 50 here, I would have one in 50 for the classical, but in quantum it's two to the 50. So you can see there's an exponential uh, associated with quantum. So it's 2 to the power 3, which is the number for 3 qubits, and 50 is 2 to the 50. And that is a huge number. In fact, it is much more than your million, trillion, and Raymond Laflamme, who has who actually have borrowed this slide from, actually calls it a pillion, which is not even in our number system. So it's so big, it's supposed to be proportional to the age of the universe. Okay. And so this is what the kind of access you get when you work with a quantum computer. Uh, this is the power of the superposition principle. And there are different devices which people are working on uh, towards making this ultimate quantum computer. And, you know, there are many contenders right now. Some have some advantages, some others have other advantages, and there is no clear winner yet. I mean, of course, these two gentlemen actually won the Nobel Prize for their contributions to this uh, just a few years ago. And so this continues. Okay. Next, we go on to the concept of what is called entanglement. Again, something uh, fascinating and you know, very mathematical, which is something I won't discuss, the mathematical part. But then it is essentially a quantum correlation, which forms the basis for many of the applications that we are working on and, uh, and the community. Okay? And this brings us to what is called the Schrodinger's cat problem. And maybe people here who are you know, fans of uh, you know, uh, sitcoms, maybe you've seen the Big Bang Theory, that there was an episode dedicated to the Schrodinger cat. Okay, so what is the Schrodinger cat? So Schrodinger cat is essentially, I mean, you know, there is a cat, he's sitting inside a box and there is a, you know, um, a, a vial there, which is full of uh, this radioactive particles. Okay, and so essentially there's a poison. And so this, this poison gas kind of thing is there. And so if the cat actually has this poison, then a radioactive particle is emitted from the box. And if he doesn't have it, then it's not, okay? So uh, to understand this, so essentially the idea is that if there is a gas, poison gas release, then there is a alpha particle which is uh, emitted. And if there is no release, then it's not. So essentially the state of the cat, and of course, if the cat has the poison, he dies, that's the idea. So if the cat is alive, that means the alpha particle is inside the uh, box. And if the cat is uh, dead, then the alpha particle has been emitted. So you see, Without actually uh, uh, doing any measurement, a cat could be in a state of being dead or alive here, right? So you don't know till you see what you, uh, whether you're measuring this alpha particle. So this actually is an example of entanglement. So the state of the alpha particle is entangled in some sense with the state of the cat. So if the cat is alive, the particle is in the box. If the cat is dead, the particle is outside. And so this is, uh, you know, uh, an example of how entanglement comes about. And uh, this is the op mathematical operation for it. Essentially, entanglement is a quantum correlation, which is uh, describing a whole, which is more than the sum of parts. Okay, And so this uh, example I really like. 
and this is of an orchestra. Okay, and so we can see that there are different people playing different music, uh, musical instruments. And uh, you know, if you hear the pianist separately, it's nice. If you hear the cellist separately, it's also very nice. But when you hear them together, that is when you hear this, you know, piece of music that was intended to be heard, which is going to only happen when all of them play together. And so entanglement is like a quantum orchestra. So if you put these things together, the whole is more than the sum of parts. It's the sum of parts plus that quantum correlation, which is what is entanglement. Okay. So our current areas of focus are manufacturing different types of photon sources because we are working on using a single photon as the quantum uh, particle, which of course we manipulate for various purposes, and then you know applying them to these different uh, domains. Okay, and and if you wanted to have a, more of an idea about photon sources, you can actually take a look at this review that I wrote with my students, which gives you an overview of different types of photon sources uh, that are possible. If there is time, I'll play a video at the end on photon sources. Uh, but then for now, I'll uh, move on. And then just tell you that essentially it's a nonlinear optics process that we are using in the lab, whereby you know the photons they come out in the shape of cones, and and these points that you see or this line that you see, this intersection point is where you do not know whether the photon belongs to this cone or this cone, and so essentially this is the entangled state. Okay, so if the first photon belongs to the right, the second one belongs to the left, and if the first one belongs to the left, the second belongs to the right. Uh, and that is how you form this HV plus VH state. Okay, and so this is how we harness entanglement. Going on to our various, um, you know, explorations, as I just mentioned earlier, we are very, very interested in different types of fundamental tests of quantum mechanics. And so this is a series of work that we have done in theory and experiment. This is our experiment in an open field. So this is a precision experiment on an open field that we managed to do, uh, whereby we have shown that a correction term is necessary to the superposition principle uh, when applied to interference experiments. So this is something which uh, wasn't uh, you know, uh, calculated before, nor was it experimentally demonstrated before. So we performed the first uh, experiment in, the, you know, in this microwave domain where we showed the presence of this correction term. Okay? This is an example of an experiment we did in fundamental quantum optics. And so this dip here, it is called the Hong O Mandel dip. Okay, and this is named after three people, Hong, O, and Mandel. And uh, this is supposed to be a signature of the quantum nature. And I won't get into the details of how and why, but then what we ended up showing is that we can have a similar dip with 100% visibility, even using classical light with uh, phase control. And so this is one of the, you know, uh, very fundamental experiments that we have done where we have shown that Hong, O, Mandel is not enough to uh, tell you about the nature of the light that you're probing, you have to go to what is called complementarity in order to do that. And so um, that is the detail, okay? Entanglement is something we study a lot in the lab. This is an example of an entangled photon source, which is sitting, which we have uh, you know, uh, aligned on our optical table. And, and the experiment that you're looking at here is what is called studies of entanglement sudden death, okay? And it sounds daunting, and in fact, it is in that sense. So, you know, you, what, what is sudden death? You talk about a healthy individual and suddenly the person is no more. That is called sudden death in, in, in biology. And when entanglement, you know, it interacts with the environment, suddenly it becomes zero, okay, because of this interaction. And that is called entanglement sudden death. And of course, that is something which we really do not want in our applications because we want to hold on to that correlation for longer. And so we have come up with our own scheme both theory and experiment where we have shown how to manipulate the sudden death so that it either happens later or doesn't happen at all. Okay? And so this is the experiment that you see here. Another genre of experiments which is really fascinating to us is what is called generalized measurements or weak measurements. And there's nothing weak about them uh, you know, in that sense. It's just that the interaction that we are probing is weak. In fact, I've had a few students come and say, oh, you know, I don't want to work on this topic because it says weak. That is a very weak argument. Uh, weak measurements is actually a very powerful tool, uh, which has been uh, in the business for the last few years experimentally. Of course, theoretically, it's been there for a long time. But we can use this, you know, uh, in a statistical ensemble sense to probe what is happening to a system between preparation and measurement. So you have you prepare a quantum system, and then it evolves, right, under some Hamiltonian, and then you measure. 
So what you are told is that if you do something in between, then you are going to change things, right? And then you will never measure what you intended to measure. Like for instance, in your double slit experiment, if you see the photon, then you don't get the interference. If you don't see the photon, you get the interference. So all this you know. And this is what is the conventional strong measurement approach. But if I weakly interact uh, with a pointer state with the system as it is evolving, then actually I'm able to gather information uh, through a statistical ensemble. And this is what is called weak measurements. And in fact, I wanted to walk you through a little uh, example of a wonderful experiment that we have just concluded in the lab, which is on what is called the quantum Cheshire cat. Okay. And so what is a quantum Cheshire cat? Now, of course, you know, people who are fairy tale fans, and I have been a big time one, uh, would know of Alice in Wonderland. Now, here we talk about Alice in Quantum Land. So what is uh, Alice in Quantum Land? You know, Alice in Wonderland had this famous uh, character, again, a cat. Have you noticed our fascination with cats? We had the Schrodinger cat. Now we have the Cheshire cat. We are really very friendly towards our fellow species, right, as quantum physicists. So this is a quantum Cheshire cat. So what is a Cheshire cat though? Cheshire cat is this, you know, very creepy cat in Alice in Wonderland. If you remember, there was this big smile that this cat had, uh, if you remember, that was the Cheshire cat. So this cat without the grin and the grin without the cat, that famous thing from Alice. So questions, have you seen a cat with a grin? Of course, I hope you would answer yes. I mean, you know, they usually seem to be smiling at us, if you notice. Have you seen a cat without grin? Well, maybe. But have you seen a grin without a cat? Now you think, okay, now I'm starting to talk about things which are getting paranormal. But that's not true. And in fact, quantum Cheshire cat is something uh, which was introduced by this group of authors in 2013. And uh, so what was the idea? Let us understand a bit better in a pictorial sense. So the concept is that this cat, you know, so the cat is sitting inside and really smiley one. And thanks to my student Surya, who did these animations, uh, very, very uh, nice ones, I must say. And so this is a cat. And the idea is that this cat can take two parts, okay, this one or this one. But the claim is that the cat and its grin, grin follow separate parts. Can you think about it? I mean, here is the cat and its grin is going somewhere else. And that is the claim, okay. So, uh, and then ultimately you have the smiling cat again. So how uh, can we conclude so? What happens in a classical scenario? Let's say the cat takes this road A and the smile or the grin is in this road B. And here we have a cat catcher, okay? Uh, who is trying to catch the cat. If this cat catcher is in road B and he blocks road B, then the cat will reach home, right? But if we block the cats in road A, then no cat reaches home. Okay, so this is what will happen if cat always takes road A in the classical sense. But now let us say the grin always takes road B and I have put a rat or a mouse here. And the assumption here uh, that Surya makes is that a mouse makes a cat happy. So a grin is associated with the mouse. So the analogy is that the mouse will perform some sort of an interaction which will give the cat its grin back. Okay, so if we put a mouse in road B, the cat always reaches home happy because the mouse is here. The cat basically, you know what it does with the mouse and reaches happy. But if there is no mouse in road B, the cat does not become happy, right? So the mouse induces happiness in the cat, which is in the other arm. This is uh, what you can conceive of in the classical sense. So the Cheshire cat concept is that the cat can take two possible paths, but actually the cat and the grin take separate paths. And this is something you cannot explain very, uh, you know, using classical concepts. You have to go to the concept of what is called quantum weak measurement, whereby you can do the math to show that you can actually have this happen. And while, you know, the cat analogy is great, what we are, of course, working on, I've just finished working on actually, is how we can have a property of a particle separated from its uh, physical location. Okay, so this is the paper that uh, the theory paper that they present at Cheshire Cat in a pre and post selected experiment. We find the cat in one place and its grin in another. The cat is a photon, uh, while the grin is its circular polarization. So we, so this is essentially the idea that you can have a particle and its property in uh, uh, dislocated from each other. And while you know uh, there has been no loophole free uh, experiment so far which has been able to demonstrate this. Uh, and, and, and we hope that our recently concluded experiment will actually be that one.
Okay, and, and so this is great. Of course, it's proof of principle. But what this means is maybe in future we can use this as you know a method by which we can separate out an undesirable property from a particle, uh, you know, or or the gender bias from a male, you know, or something like that. So that is uh, what this actually is looking forward. How such a phenomena, which is of course at a fundamental level, can find such wonderful uh, you know technological applications. Maybe in error correction, you separate out the error from uh, the system. So this is uh, an example. Our approach to quantum computing is a, a little unconventional. So you uh, will hear, as I said, details next week. But then you understood that you know a quantum computer is based on this concept of qubits or quantum bits, where it, where, which is a two-level system, right? And so we had this come in, this power come in from two to the power n. So if you have n qubits, then you have two to the power n. So now what we are working on is instead of working with qubits, we are working with what are called q dips or higher dimensional systems. And so what is the advantage of that? So essentially a qubit has two basis states, a q trit can have three basis states, okay? And so it will be alpha zero plus beta one plus gamma two. And so if you want to see the advantage, we take an example, a very simple example of a football match, okay? So if I have a football match and I, let's say I want to use qubits to declare the results, so uh, one thing I can do is, you know, let's say there are four possible results. There is a win, there is a loss, maybe there is a rain abandoned match, and maybe um, there is uh, something which prevents the match from getting over, which is not rain. So four possibilities. So one qubit has two levels, so I can only uh, declare two results through that. So I need two qubits to essentially have four possibilities, right? But if I had a Q quad, which is essentially a four level system, then I can use these four uh, to declare them with only one such system, right? So essentially, by using a higher dimensional system, I can have access to the same dimensionality of the state space, we say, uh, than having many uh, lower dimensional ones. So this 50 qubit, you know, this has been a holy grail. And in fact, some companies have now claimed that they have uh, managed the 50 qubit quantum processor. But then two to the power 50 took us a long time to reach. That is because you see qubits don't like to, um, you know, be put together beyond, it's almost like human beings, right? If there are a few of us in a room, we are okay. We have our space, but if you keep putting more and more in the same room, then we're getting into each other's space. And that leads to lack of coherence. And in the quantum computing scenario, it's called decoherence. And that is what leads to uh, the loss of superposition. And so that is why it's difficult to put more and more uh, in a coherent superposition. That is where the higher dimensional system can come in because we need less of them. So two cubed is eight, three squared is nine. And so essentially two Q trips and three qubits uh, can achieve a similar uh, dimensionality. And so this is the whole domain of higher dimensional systems, which is what we're working on. And we have done a lot of work here uh, in terms of, you know, setting up an architecture in the lab where we have two nearly maximally entangled Q trips using our own uh, developed technique called pump beam modulation, which I will uh, not attempt to explain in detail. But the idea is that by using aperture systems and modulating the pump beam in the down conversion process, which is the nonlinear optics process, I can actually create a pair of Q trips which carry the properties of the pump. So if I have now modulated my pump beam spatial uh, domain with this, uh, you know, three slit, let's say, architecture, then my two daughter photons, as we call them, will also carry forth this architecture. So this is how it looks in the lab. Okay. And so this is the idea. The pump profile can be transferred to the daughter photons faithfully. So this is the pump and these are the uh, daughter photons, which are this uh, two Q trips that I'm talking about. Okay, and so this is what we have. We have beautiful correlation between these Q trips. And in recent work, so you know, earlier we had managed to show this architecture and this wonderful correlation that the Q trips share. But now we have gone on to actually devise new methods of uh, measuring the amount of entanglement that is there in this architecture. And in fact, this is using a record low number of measurements, uh, uh, avoiding the, you know, the conventional route. And, and, and so we're very happy with this new results, uh, which are here, where we have been able to come up with this measure and also show it experimentally. Okay, and so this is the in, uh, interference graph. So the idea is that we have these results and we have been able to show a first direct measurement of what we call an entanglement monotone. Okay, I won't get into the details, but then a direct measurement has not been done before.
people usually derive them through uh, other measurements which are done and then construct, reconstruct them. So we have done a direct measurement and also uh, demonstrated that they are not quite equivalent, which has a lot of ramifications. Okay. And we are working on uh, quantum computing architectures now using this approach and also uh, various QIP protocols, both in communication and computing using these higher uh, dimensions. Okay. Uh, and in fact, uh, for, the, for the young people, if you wanted to have an overview, then this is an invited article that I wrote in the Scientific American, uh, which kind of gives you an overview of this uh, domain of work that we are pursuing. Okay. Okay. Another thing we have done very recently, which we are very happy about, is uh, uh, come up with a new technique for estimating the quantum state. And, and uh, this is based on interference, something completely different from the convention. So in order to give you a flavor of the convention, I have this daunting slide here. And if for people who know, this is actually, uh, you know, different projections of a CT scan. And unfortunately, currently the CT scan is too much in the news, right? It's supposed to be the definitive test for the thing that is plaguing uh, society right now. But then having said that, how does it work? So, you know, the idea is that if you're doing a CT scan of the lungs or the brain, you don't directly uh, have an invasive measurement. You take different projections of the organ and then reconstruct the image. That is what is called tomography. Okay. And so this is the basis for the CT scan. And same thing we do for a quantum state also. We actually take different projective measurements and reconstruct the uh, state that uh, we would have started with. But then here, actually, we do many, many measurements as we go in her to higher dimensions. And for instance, you can see it requires d square minus one measurements. And so for four dimension, it will be 15, four square minus one. So what we have been able to do is by using interference, we've come up with a new method called quantum state interferography, where we only need d minus one interferograms to do this, which is, of course, uh, a, a paradigm shift, right? So instead of a square, we are now linear and that too, just d minus one. So for four dimension, you just need three and so on. And for two dimension, which is qubit, it's a single shot measurement. So we're very happy uh, with this development and we have shown this beautiful. So this is the experimental uh, picture, but then, you know, you can see that the states we have reconstructed have very high fidelity. What is fidelity? It is the match with your expected state. And, you know, that is in the high 90 percent. Uh, Going on to uh, the last topic that I wanted to introduce you to in this rather um, brief overview, uh, which of course we are very highly invested in as a lab, is quantum communication. Okay, quantum communication. In fact, the uh, quantum aspect boils down to being the key distribution problem. Is perhaps the most quote unquote practical quantum technology. Okay, and why you should worry about it? Well, you should. I mean, you know. These are all things, whether you're purchasing something using a credit card or online banking or voting, you know, or people in the defense who are securing, keeping our borders secure. All of them, all these are examples of communication which require some level of security, right? So these are all examples where you don't want the information to reach a, an unwanted party. You don't want your banking details to reach someone who would, uh, you know, uh, quickly change it uh, and suddenly you have nothing left. You don't want that. So these are strategic communications. At the moment, the way this is being kept secure is through what is called classical cryptography. So essentially you have some information. It is encrypted using what is called a key. Okay. And then the receiver also has a copy of this key, which he or she uses to decrypt. And then that way your information transfer is secure. That is classical. But then the problem is that this will be compromised with quantum computers. Because quantum computers will run certain algorithms which will break this hardness of the classical communication. And so this is a catastrophe. And the solution also has to come from quantum, which is quantum cryptography. In classical, you cannot have unconditional security. Because you see, these sort of protocols which are being used for keeping things secure are based on the hardness of problems. So for instance, this RSA, it is based on the hardness of the factorization problem. So if I say what is 3 times 7, you'll probably say 21 without batting an eyelid. But if I tell you what are the prime factors of 1, 1, 3, 3, 7, 1, it is a harder problem. So factorization is a harder problem 
than uh, multiplication, for instance. And in fact, the factorization problem is in a hardness class, which can be used as a basis for keeping things secure. But this algorithm by Peter Shore uh, actually can break this hardness, okay, and make factorization an easier problem on a quantum computer. And so then it's a catastrophe, right? And so what do we do? So essentially, computational resources grow very fast, and today's hard problem could be solved tomorrow using brute force attack. You can have new algorithms for classical computers, then you have these quantum computers coming in. So my security should be independent of future advancements in computational power, new algorithms or new technology, that is, it should be future secure. That is why we need quantum cryptography, where the security is based on the laws of nature or the laws of quantum mechanics and not on the hardness of a problem. Okay. And so this is quantum key distribution. There are, of course, uh, remember that, you know, we need around 4,000 qubits and 100 million gates to actually make this uh, Shor's algorithm a threat. But then this thing is going very fast, the progress towards quantum computing. So it may not, it may not be very distant future when we would have this. Okay? So it's not time to be complacent right now. And so that is, uh, you know, an overview of the work that we are doing on quantum communications at RRI. So we are working on India's first project on satellite-based QKD. We are doing integrated photonics-based QKD. We're working on what is called quantum teleportation, which is something which uh, we can discuss if there is time in the chat. And then also working on what is called device independent random number generation. Again, something which is very useful for quantum communications. Okay. And so I uh, skip details of the principles, but then essentially these are the principles of quantum mechanics, which keep information secure. There are different approaches, prepare and measure, entanglement based, so on. And then there is this what is called device independent QKD. So essentially, if I don't even trust my devices, suppose there is some malicious uh, party who has manufactured my devices, then also if I, how will I make things secure then? Then I will go to what is called device independent QKD, where entanglement plays a crucial role. Okay. And so we have been working on all the protocols. So these are the prepare and measure based ones. This is the BB84 demonstration, which we did uh, several years ago. And then uh, more recently, we did what is called a B92 protocol, which was in fact India's first published experiment in free space quantum uh, communication. Uh, so uh, this uh, was published in Physical Review Applied. So people who are interested do have a look. It's a very detailed paper where we have come up with a new implementation of the B92, which has higher security and key rate than the previous ones. And, uh, and I'll skip the details, but then the key rate which is, you know, the, how, how, how many keys do I have per second? And what kind of errors do I have? These are very important. And, you know, this was the earlier results from other people. So key rate was lower and the error was higher. So in fact, to our knowledge, ours is in fact better than the available literature till date using heralded photons. Okay. We have done entanglement-based QKD. And as these are, this is how it looks in the lab. I wish I could show it to you in person. And uh, we have very nice entanglement that we have achieved. So if a high value, highest value being one, we have 0.995, which of course is as high as one can get. Okay. And this is the paper that I was talking about. If you wanted to have a look. And, and one of the things which we have done here, I, I don't know what happened. My, okay. And, and in fact, this particular work also led to a lot of, uh, you know, appreciation from the, uh, from the general uh, public, you know, from, from common, from people around us who are not perhaps scientists. So there was a lot of, uh, you know, positive discussion about this work that we found. Another thing we did uh, through this is actually come up with a simulation toolkit for QKD. So, you know, quantum key distribution is actually an experimental architecture. So it will come with its errors, right? Every experiment will have some shortcomings, which is natural. So if you put all those in, then the kind of expectations you will have for your key distribution will be more realistic. And so whatever we found in literature, these people did not really worry too much about this realistic aspect. And so our QKD sim, as we call it, our simulation toolkit actually takes care of all these requirements and makes a QKD more practically realizable. Uh, and, and I think this is a very important development because it will contribute to the uh, community at large, right? And so, you know, basically taking into account the realistic imperfections and non-idealities. It's based on what is called the Agifold model of software development, okay? And the uh, match between theory and experiment is very nice. Going on to long distance quantum communications, which kind of forms the basis for various things we have done so far. So, you know, 
Uh, of course, you know, having quantum communication happen within the lab is fine. It's great for demonstration purposes. But actually, this will be useful when people start using it when they're not located in the same location, right? If the defense wants to use it, if India wants to say something to Russia, uh, it has to be able to do that using quantum communication. So you need to increase the distance. But there are problems with conventional approaches. So if you just increase the free space distance, then beyond the point, the line of sight is an issue. Because you don't see each other, then you cannot communicate. If you do this through fibers, then you know you'll have to put in amplifiers every few kilometers because fibers have losses. But you can't do that in a conventional sense because you violate no cloning theorem. In quantum, you cannot just copy like that an unknown state. So you need an out-of-the-box solution. And these are essentially the ones that the community is pursuing globally. One is using what is called repeaters and relay technologies, and the other is using satellites. Okay. And so we are working on a project under the DST, a quantum enabled science and technology program towards these relays, memories and repeaters. And so the idea is very simple. It reminds you of your childhood when you used to do this relay race, you know, this baton. And so there was a steam here and steam here. And one person would run with this something in the hand and give it to the, you know, uh, one person in the opponent team or whatever in the, and then that um, girl will come here and pass over the bait into the second person. And so that is how it will go. So this is called a relay and that's the relay race. And similarly, what that is what we do with entanglement. We actually uh, pass on the entanglement from one pair of, so two, two, part, two pairs of photons are entangled, okay? But then what we do by using what is called entanglement swapping, we actually make two and three entangled. Instead of one, two, three, and four, now two and three are entangled. And this way we can increase the distance, okay? Now, what about satellites for long distance QKD? That is, of course, uh, another idea which is actually being pursued uh, globally. And so the idea being that, you know, another way to increase the distance would be that even if the two ground stations are not having line of sight, if a satellite comes and spends some time on top of one, you know, and exchange is a key, and then in its pass, it goes over to another ground station and exchanges a key. Then by performing certain operations, these two ground stations, which are in no way uh, connected with each other through line of sight, are connected through a quantum link. And this is the idea of using a satellite as a trusted node. Okay, And uh, this is what we are working on. And, and there are different things you can do by... Uh, the, big picture that we are working towards is what is called the global quantum communication network. So here you have the satellite, which is actually, you know, maybe able to have a quantum link enables between several thousands of kilometers. But then again, this local node is connected to different service providers uh, through say fiber network. So combination of fiber and satellite will lead to this global quantum communication network or the quantum internet. And that is what our lab is working on which is essentially, uh, you know, if hopefully in my lifetime, we will see that this is something where many countries are connected by and, and uh, we have secure communication uh, between countries uh, through a network. And so that is what we are contributing to. Okay, And there are different approaches from different countries which are currently going on. And here I would like to uh, uh, pause and, and show you a video on this particular experiment. Um, so I hope that it would work as it worked in the demo sessions to stop sharing and you're still with me right because of course you know oh uh, yes ma'am <laughs> yeah thanks so let me just do what we did earlier and hope for the best so can you please tell me uh, uh, if you are able to see uh, something on your screen which is gray oh uh, yes you can see something okay. Can you hear? This is to inform. Did you hear anything? Yes, ma'am, we can. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. About a recent exciting development in our ongoing project on quantum experiments using satellite technology or QUEST, which is a collaboration between the Quantum Information and Computing Lab at the Raman Research Institute in Bengaluru and the Indian Space Research Organization. The QUEST project was started back in 2017 with several ambitious milestones and deliverables in its journey towards ultimately establishing satellite-based secure quantum communications between two Indian ground stations using an Indian satellite. The recent most exciting breakthrough that has now been achieved by the project is the successful demonstration of entanglement-based quantum key distribution in free space between two buildings at RRI 
across an atmospheric free space channel. This is India's first reported free space quantum key distribution experiment which connects two buildings using an atmospheric channel. Here we see the live alignment of the experiment as it happens within the lab. This is a shot of our entangled photon source which is following the Saniac based geometry. Our entangled source actually has a very high fidelity of around 99%. The experiment is done at night time so that we can capture the actual photons. Now we take a walk outside the lab where we see the Bob substation for the free space experiment. Here we have a view of the full link with both Alice and Bob who are currently separated by around 50 meters. This forms our free space atmospheric channel. Here we see my student aligning the telescope and how the alignment laser looks in a dark night. The path that is traced out here is the path that is taken by the entangled photons in the free space experiment. Now we go on to the technical details. Here we see the schematic of the BBM92 protocol which has been established in our lab. We have the ALICE setup, the BOB setup and the SANIAC based entangled photon source. Here we have a snapshot of the in-lab entanglement based QKD protocol results. We have a very good key rate of around 160 to 65 kilobits per second and the error rate has been curtailed to 11 percent to keep it within the information theoretic security threshold. Here we have the first preliminary results for the free space atmospheric channel entanglement based QKD protocol where we already have a key rate of greater than 1 kilobit per second and again an error rate which is curtailed to the information theoretic security threshold of 11 percent. One of the notable ones is the establishment of the first free space QKD experiment within the lab using a prepared and measure based protocol which was a variant of the B92 protocol and it was published in Physical Review Applied last year. Going on to the acknowledgements, we would like to acknowledge the Indian Space Research Organization for their support, the project team members at RRI for their dedication, hard work and motivation, the project review board members, the project management board, the EEG, MES and ENB section at RRI as well as the administration for their support. We also thank Professor Avinash Deshpande for his support and advice in resolving critical issues related to time synchronization. Thank you. Okay, so I hope uh, you could hear that. I, I just want to, uh, I will finish uh, now with going back to my presentation. Right. So as I, I mean, you know, I just wanted to give you a flavor of how things work, you know, in the lab and how we are doing this free space experiment, which we are very excited by. And so this is, uh, of course, the project and this is how it looks, you know, these are the various buildings at RRI, uh, between which we, this is our little ground station. And um, here you have the Alice and the Bob and the link that we just saw. Okay, we just discussed that in the video. Uh, and in fact, even, you know, uh, here also we have been very, uh, you know, what should I say, uh, grateful to uh, people for their interest that they showed uh, in these results that we had for the first free space demonstration uh, of entanglement based QKD in India. And it was something that was taken up very enthusiastically uh, by uh, various sectors. So this is, uh, you know, how we did the experiment because we have been precisely doing this for now one and a half years and hopefully it will end soon but not our enthusiasm uh, is not masked is what we believe 
and uh, yeah this this these developments in the quantum communication you know the the, the qkd um, experiment as well as the toolkit they were they were really uh, much appreciated so in fact the dst they came up with uh, 20 major success stories of dst in 2020 and uh, we were uh, featured there for both our work in quantum communication as well as our quantum state estimation protocol which is quantum state interferography and uh, this experiment was done in collaboration with hri ilhabad and i discussed this with you earlier uh, even the vigyan prasar you know which is in collaboration with india science maybe uh, this is something you know the young people should definitely follow this is our a uh, science channel india actually has a science channel called india science and they they cover very interesting science news um you know weekly so you should definitely have a look at that and so they actually had uh, this again a top 10 uh, inventions or you know uh, for indian science in 2020 and uh, our work uh, also featured them yeah and of course you know one of the recent things which uh, is uh, is very nice is this recognition uh, for from asocham for uh, uh, you know making whatever difference uh, in the cyber uh, sector okay uh while uh, this is great you know we um, i mean you know this uh, i hope you got an overview of the uh, different activities that we are working on and and various projects that we are leading uh and some of them actually are beyond just small project right so this is involving uh, collaborations and and uh, having a, a scope as well as resource Uh, as well as expectation which is beyond uh, uh, the smaller projects that we're working on and so this is very nice but then of course you know what uh, this particular thing again uh, tells me that we would like to actually move to a situation where you know this is what we would have you know some some recognition for essentially uh, the topic not necessarily for uh, being of a certain gender making a difference to that topic but then at the moment we do need uh such avenues for various you know sectors because we do need to encourage uh, women to uh, continue in science and 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 also excel and so that is why this makes sense now but hopefully this will not make sense in a few years time because you know uh, it won't be necessary that is exactly what i would really uh, hope uh, you know because having said this you know uh, these things that i tried to Uh, tell you about regarding these projects uh while there have been many people and agencies who have been extremely supportive of course there have also been many people in agencies who have actually uh you know um tried to undermine our contributions and 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 you know not acknowledge them and this is something which uh, we cannot uh you know i i again borrow from uh, shubhavati this uh, talk last week about how she said nevertheless she persisted right so th- i wanted to end with this particular notion uh, uh, about what is being ambitious okay and so uh, essentially ambitious you would say is somebody who is driven who is goal oriented right uh, and then again apparently ambitious is also being difficult or attention seeking okay and so you can always you can actually imagine uh, that this obviously has a gender based discrimination right so the driven and goal oriented definition perhaps is for uh, many of the male colleagues who are ambitious okay but the female colleagues if they are too ambitious then you know they are uh, sort of reported to be oh this she's a difficult person to work with uh, she's always driving us you know or 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 maybe you know the uh, if the accomplishments get some recognition then it becomes attention seeking so uh, this is something that we actually do have this sort of a uh, discrimination even in the category of being ambitious same word can have two interpretations with our conscious unconscious gender bias but of course my advice would be to the younger people and not so young people is i mean so far as i am concerned that's what i do uh, don't worry believe in yourself and your goals move ahead with honesty sincerity and determination maybe walk an extra mile just to prove a point but then don't give up on the ambitions on the uh, you know aspirations and on the desire to continue with a career in science okay and so with that i would like to end this is what we are looking at at the future you know different sorts of communication computing information processing i would say future is bright future is in quantum and and this is a slide in which you know we have various people who have visited us in better times 
and 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 this is actually the opening of my lab on the left here you see these three ribbons this is how we traditionally had my lab opening and uh, and these are various dignitaries who have come and gone so with that i would like to uh, thank you for your attention and uh, i hope i was almost on time vandana and uh, disha so thank you so much ma'am it was wonderful to uh, like listen from you and learn uh, from you uh, like most of the people actually loved your journey they uh, put messages on zoom chat when you described in the beginning and they also loved the references which you described to explain all these physics phenomena so it was wonderful thank you uh, now i would quickly like to ask some of the questions which people have posted uh, yeah. so will how can we decide which qubit is useful for us and how to deal with it so you see uh, the qubit is something that you are actually uh, preparing right so you already know which are the two states of the system that you are going to harness as a quantum bit so the the, the idea so i think you are coming from the cheshire cat description so it's not about the qubit being useful or useless it's more about its interaction with the environment okay and so now when when something is interacting with the environment then it might sort of inculcate some undesirable property yeah and so you know there are different types of damping channels and so on but then the idea is this leads to different types of errors and so that is what we would like to uh, get rid of um in future so of course our experiment is a proof of principle experiment that in possible it's possible by using completely conventional means to actually have a particle which is representing your qubit and let's say uh its uh, property separated but now we will of course have to work towards uh using this for such purposes so qubit uh, i hope uh, that is where you were uh, coming from in terms of the qubit being useful so um yeah okay ma'am so uh, next question is what could be the physical reason behind the correction term to the superposition ah yes so that one is a talk by itself but then the idea is uh, and before you get me wrong so superposition principle is fine what we usually tend to do is ignore one term which we shouldn't be doing so now think about these two slits okay and so uh, gosh this is the camera okay so now the wave function for the single slit open is let's say psi a and the second slit is psi b what we tend to do is when both slits are open we say that the wave function is psi a plus psi b but that is not correct because when you have both slits open it's a new boundary value problem so essentially you can have interactions between the slits and beautifully you can explain it using path integral formalism if you are actually into this so you have these club paths which are not dominant which would come forth when both slits are open and so that the contribution we usually push under the carpet we just say that it is psi a plus psi b and so the intensity is mod psi a plus psi b whole square but then we need that correction uh, because of this third uh, boundary condition that we have imposed and that is what we have actually calculated in theory in the the in the prl paper that i showed you and then in the follow up the experimental work in njp we have shown how uh, we can uh, actually quantify this term by using again uh, you know a slit based interference which i don't want to get into now so that is the idea okay uh, yeah. so next question uh, does quantum entanglement leads to any loss of data or information <clears throat> no um, I, i'm not sure of the context here so quantum entanglement is a, a correlation that is shared by uh, conventionally let's say two particles but it could be multi party also uh, that's a different story so it's a correlation that is shared uh, between let's say two particles for this argument and uh, there is no uh, relation of this with loss of data what it can do is actually enable secure data transfer so it's quite the opposite so um uh maybe this question one needs to understand better where the you know the query is coming from because there is no correlation between loss of data here so entanglement is a correlation which is used as a resource for keeping data secure you know in for instance the protocol that i showed you uh, bbm 92 which is based on using entanglement as a resource so there is no uh, inherent uh, relationship between these two phenomena yeah. okay ma'am uh, so question is uh, what do you mean by a pure state ah uh okay so that i i don't know whether i can do okay so maybe i should just do it to this without writing anything but then the idea is that you know when you have um, a state uh, so essentially you uh, a pure state is a state which does not have these 
uh, essentially any um, decoherent tongue. So how do I explain this? So uh, psi, you know, the ket psi that we say, that is a pure state. So you can actually write it down as a state. But if you have a mixed state, so okay, in the terms of the block sphere, that is the best thing that you could do here. So the states which basically are in the in, in a inner part of the sphere, Okay, so the states which are on top of the sphere, those would be the pure states and the states which are in the inner part, those are the mixed states. So the mixed states are those which require density matrices to actually uh, represent them. You, don't, you can't write it as a psi. So it is actually a ket psi bra psi uh, and that is a, a, a mixed state. So a mixed state is something which uh, has a purity less than one and that is why you, know, you are talking about this uh, portion which is not on the top in that sense. So that is the best we can do in the current uh, scenario without starting to write down the form and all, which I would perhaps avoid. Okay. Uh, yeah. So ma'am, I'll now just ask one last question since the time is uh, like uh, going on. So uh, so how do we adopt satellite base K, uh, QKB for long haul communication? Satellite has less uh, covering range. So somebody has commented. Uh, satellite. So the, how do we do satellite-based communication if it has less covering it? So what was, so can you repeat that once? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's the question. So, uh, so uh, the comment is that uh, it has less covering range. So how do you do it for uh, like uh, long covering uh, communication? See, if you're going to use something like a lower orbit satellite, so essentially this satellite is going to, you know, go around the earth. So it's around 500, 600 kilometers away from you. So it has a certain orbit, right? So uh, it, I mean, I'm not entirely sure what it means by the range here, but then this guy, this satellite is going to come and spend some time on top of a certain ground station. And then in its orbit, it's going to reach the other one at some point. And so this is how, so by using the link that the satellite establishes between GS1 and ground station 2, uh, we are going to uh, be able to connect these two up using a quantum link. So now you can also think of, you know, at the moment we are working on low Earth orbit as the aim, but then if you go to geosynchronous, uh, geostationary, uh, you know, satellite, which is thousands of kilometers away, right? So there maybe the reach is even more. So essentially, uh, think about it. If you want to send something from the satellite, then yes, you cannot send it beyond a certain uh, distance. Maybe that is where you're coming from. But then if you some send something towards the satellite, then that is not an issue. But if the satellite is now even higher, then of course it can connect up much further locations. So that would be a next step, which is something that will only happen once you know a LEO uh, works well. Because if there's only one successful satellite QPD experiment, globally so far which is the one from china and so all the uh, you know other efforts are currently in different stages of development was that oh, i yeah. hope that answered uh, yeah. yeah so thank you so much uh, uh Rushi. it was really a wonderful talk and you can see it from many many comments and uh, appreciating both the way you you mixed up the personal story and making it really very motivational and giving us a flavor of the most uh, interesting uh, physics that you are doing. And I'm sure Excellent. all of them are uh, inspired uh, about it and we hope some of them will be pursuing this field in the coming years. Absolutely. I also take this opportunity to thank Disha for conducting the lecture and we are really sorry that because the time is advanced we couldn't take all the questions but as always we are now keeping the track of the questions and we will uh, forward them to the speaker she can answer them at leisure and we will uh, put this back to you on the moodle discussion and i she her actually web page address is already there in the special lecture brochures we will also share her email with you so thank you all for joining us today for this uh, wonderful lecture and uh, also our thanks to all our youtube viewers also and just want to remind you that for the VV participants in the Zoom room, there is an informal session at 6 o'clock. So we hope to see you back after the break. And that's